Hello, hello. All right, perfect. Test, um, test, 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 test one through three. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming uh, today for a panel around the uh, Open Container Initiative and the future of container standardization. Um, we have a great set of folks today to uh, talk a little bit about their involvement in OCI and kind of where they see the project uh, going in the future. Um, for those of uh, you that are in the room, how many people actually know of the Open Container Initiative OCI with a show of hands? That's actually a lot better than I expected, so kind of flies under the radar sometimes, but um, that's great. Um, so to kind of kick things off, um, I'll have each panelist uh, kind of intro uh, themselves in terms of uh, their background and how they're uh, and, you know, uh, involved with the project, not only themselves, but their company, and we'll kind of go, it, uh, go from there, and we'll kind of be laid back in terms of uh, questions from the audience. I have a basically handful of questions to ask these folks, and then we'll kind of open it up to the audience for any questions. So let's go start with, uh, let's start with Patrick on, on, on that end. Uh, so hi everybody, I'm Patrick Chanezon, I work at Docker. Uh, my involvement, I, I've been involved in creating OCI at the beginning. Uh, I'm not in it day to day. On the Docker side, we have uh, Michael Crosby, who's doing the runtime spec, and Stephen Day, uh, the image spec. Uh, yeah, so that's it. And good afternoon. My name is Jeff Boric, and I work for IBM, and I've been working in and around open source for about a decade now, going back to uh, cross platform. Uh, Linux strategy for IBM systems, but uh, for the last two plus years I've been working in and, uh, in and around the uh, open ecosystems associated with the um, foundation of the OCI, uh, early work with Docker, uh, OpenStack, uh, the Open API initiative, so ask me about open after the session if you'd like. Cool. Um, my name is Vincent Batts. Um, uh, have been in, uh, so I work at Red Hat. I've been in and around uh, this, the container open source community for about three and a half years. Yeah. Um, and particularly with, with the Open Containers Initiative uh, for the last year and a half, uh, maintainer of various projects and on the technical oversight board. So pretty well vested there. I'm Brandon Phillips, the CTO and co founder of CoreOS. Uh, we got involved in OCI as one of the uh, project co-founders with uh, Red Hat and Docker and a lot of the other folks on stage. And I sit on the technical oversight board and chair the technical oversight board of the OCI. And yeah, and along with uh, Vincent and everybody else, we've written a large bulk of the specification. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sarya Das. Uh, I'm a product manager in the Azure Container Service team. Uh, Microsoft is, of course, involved in uh, OCI specification. So um, to kind of kick things off with my first question. So this morning, I'm sure a lot of uh, folks heard the announcement that uh, ContainerD and Rocket are coming into CNCF. Um, I've had the unfortunate job of uh, being pinged by a lot of folks of what that actually means for the OCI and how that's related. So uh, I will properly deflect that question to our panelists uh, to kind of give an update to everyone here uh, on that. So um, feel free to kind of uh, answer in any way you want to, so from your perspective. Uh, sure. Um, so I, I think I look at it from essentially two different consumers. There's the people who are building containers and the the software that then downloads and executes the containers. For OCI, uh, my primary concern, and I think the reason why a lot of us are involved, is we want to give confidence to all of you, the users, that there is a specification that you can build against, that you can build your applications against, and then have some reasonable expectation that uh, given somebody building a piece of software that can execute, that image, um, there's a stamp that your thingy that you built maybe last week or a year ago or two years ago is able to be executed and ran um, in an expected way on the other side. Um, I, I'm sympathetic to the people who have to execute the container, um, but uh, which is the hard work that is done inside of container D and, and Rocket, but primarily I'm concerned with ensuring that we have these specs so that there's confidence that building a container today um, means that it will work uh, into the future. 
that's kind of how I, I think of it. And then the responsibilities are that um, really Rocket and Container D are systems that make different trade-offs in order to execute those containers. Um, and it's really uh, up to the users. And I think it's great that there's this joint announcement because um, they're good at different use cases. Uh, yeah, so on the Docker side, I, I gave our perspective this morning. Uh, OCI is the spec, and so run C is the reference implementation for the runtime spec. But it's at the spec level, uh, and then container D is an implementation of that spec, and it actually includes run C. Uh, so I'd say when people are asking what does it mean for OCI, it's just one more implementation of OCI. Awesome. Um, well, I'll, I'll take that as an answer. Um, so uh, I'll give you one last uh, opinion sure. if you like. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, the, um, uh, at the end of the day, quick show of hands, how many out in the audience have been involved in SDOs or traditional standards development organizations in the past? Yep. Okay, so, you know, I think everyone's obviously seen a large shift over the last decade to a focus from a kind of a standards first type of orientation towards the rapid activity that's happening in open source communities. And when, you know, IBM's certainly been heavily involved with open source for, you know, over 15 years now, but one of the big things that IBM focuses on is trying to make sure that when something takes off in an open community from an open source software perspective, it's not just open around this open source license, but it's also open in terms of the way the project's govern. So IBM's been working across different constituencies and ecosystems and vendors to try and work with and bring folks into things like the Linux Foundation to try and ensure that this really you know, takes off and a rising tide can float all boats. Awesome. Um, to to kind of get back to kind of Patrick's point a little bit about Container D and what aspects of you know OCI are kind of part of that. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people get confused in terms of what actually is kind of in scope for OCI. Um, you know, versus you know what's available in Rocket and some other implementations out there. Does anyone kind of want to speak to this? Because when we first created OCI, we we, we, we very deliberately limited the scope of, of, of the project is, is kind of one way to put it uh, <laughs> uh, for, for whatever many reasons that was. Uh, but, you know, just for the education of the audience, uh, do you kind of want to speak to, uh, you know, kind of delineation line of, you know, what's in OCI and versus kind of um, in the higher level implementations like Rocket and Containerd and all the stuff that they do. So, but you haven't spoke yet, Vincent, so please speak. Okay. Um, so some of, some of it has either just been, um, so the interesting thing about uh, OCI and to some extent CNCF, but because OCI has been um, trying to lead with some certain, certain amount of specification that CNCF uh, effectively wants to depend on because some of the projects uh, that are being grown out of or added to CNCF to grow depend on what the work being done in OCI is. Um, but it's been an open governance model um, from, from the beginning. And so some of that uh, has kind of led to, um, I don't think it's codified or anything anywhere, mostly just kind of a general feeling that OCI has been specifications, CNCF has been code. Um, there are, uh, that's, that's obviously not hard and fast because run C is over there, even though if it's a, it's a re imp reference implementation. OCI now has um, libraries for how to handle the digest of layers. It now has some SE Linux libraries. So there is code in OCI. And I think uh, CNI is in CNCF, and that has some specifications not, to it as well. Not yet. Oh, it's not. Oh. The TOC decision. That's fine. But still. So there, there's, there's, there are going to be some amount of, even if, even if just de facto standards arising out of CNCF, maybe not codified specifications, and there is code that lives in OCI. So the line is blurry, no doubt. Um, but the, as far as the scope, the, because of all the folks that are involved, and uh, I think to some people's dismay, we wanted OCI to start off with the simplest building blocks because some of this has been moving so fast and we are to some extent a trailing specification. We wanted those basic building blocks. So when folks say, why is this not being done in OCI yet or blah, 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 why are you just doing runtime and image? 
Uh, we needed that conversation first because anything that builds on after that, distribution, signing, so on and so forth, some of the things that kind of challenge what is in scope, it's all, let's get the first building blocks done first and then we can move on and have these other conversations uh, because even those simple building blocks, like Brandon said, uh, the tooling that builds on it, that consumers want to rely on for an indefinite future, all this comes back to certain building blocks. This is, our, this is the scope right now. Um, as you get higher in the stack, it, it gets a little blurry whether or not you're just talking about a de facto standard or a specification. Um, so, uh, just to get concrete, um, when OCI uh, started, the, the, the initial scope was around a runtime, so actually how a process gets executed and, and that sort of stuff, um, how the C groups get set up, the environment variables, blah, blah, blah. And then um, after that, we had uh, a vote where we added into scope um, the image format, so actually how all these files get globbed together. Um, and all the metadata associated with the image. And then some things that people have wanted to discuss uh, post 1.0 for uh, OCI is potentially how signing and signing metadata works and then potentially um, the, the way things actually, or at least recommendations about how things get uh, shipped around. Um, so that kind of gives you a scope. Scope initially started as runtime, expanded to image format, and then future stuff, maybe like signing or shipping stuff around. Yeah, do, um, do any of you um, uh, remember the RSS wars or, <laughs> or have been involved in that? No, okay, so uh, Adam, maybe uh, it's <laughs> a wrong example then. Uh, just on, on, the, on the standardization, what I would say is uh, uh, standards are really good to uh, get an agreement by everybody in an industry when we have stopped innovating in a certain area where everybody agrees on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why OCI uh, had, um, uh, should I say, very opinionated discussions uh, at its creation, I think we can <laughs> say that, uh, about what the scope should be uh, uh, until we just agreed on an intersection that was the container runtime. Uh, and then we expanded that to uh, the image format. Uh, I think it's a testament to uh, the fact that there's a really, uh, like, really good collaboration that we're nearing a 1.0 for these standards, and I think it will really help the industry and, and lift all boats for everybody. So, so to kind of expand on your point, uh, you know, one of my favorite questions I get in my inbox for people is like, so, when, you know, when is OCI shipping 1.0? What's taking so long? And, uh, uh, and, I, think and, and, I, I think it's I think it's I think it's time for Microsoft to answer. Oh, no, <laughs> and and so uh, <laughs> and you know honestly for and, and yeah and, and my response is generally you know if for a standards body we're actually moving you know pretty decently. Look how long it took like HTTP 2.0 and all that yeah. shit to take place. So uh, you know geez look how fast the W3C moves for things. So uh, but I won't answer this question. I'll have someone in the panel talk about. It. So I know we're close. There, there's, there's rumors on the street that we may be shipping. 1.0 soon. Uh, I'll just say that during the uh, uh, expo uh, drink ticket break this evening, we'll all be doing a stand-up routine with uh, our, our favorite standards jokes. Like, um, <laughs> you know, I love standards. There's so many to choose from. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, to put Vincent on the spot. Yeah, I was about to say, I just, I just got finished talking. Um, uh, well, it, it, it is kind of funny, and I get asked this often enough, um, uh, that... It, there, there is a, a dichotomy at play, and in, open source is a bizarre and wonderful convergence. Um, uh, and you see <laughs> the, the, the San Francisco Bay mindset when it's like, we're at a year and a half into this, and people are like, oh God, like, <laughs> like why is this not done already? Um, and then, and then I go talk to folks in the industry, and they're like, "This is moving very fast. Like, are we sure? I mean, like, you're you're comfortable with this? Like, like less than two years, and you're ready for a 1.0? Like, woo. Um, and so, we are in a, a bizarre intersection. But the, the the testament is that much of this is being used in production yeah. already, and and there are plenty of tools, projects, and uh, all the way up the stack, and to a large degree. 
some of this is an implementation detail. Um, it, it is almost by design boring, um, uh, and as it should be, but that, that, that same testament means that this stuff is being used in production, some of it even pre-release, like there's already been folks implement to some of the release candidates and there would be a slight change and they had to retool. Uh, that's where we are with the, um, so both the image spec and the runtime spec are at a 1.0.0 release candidate five. There's no, in, there's no formal cadence to say thou shalt have, well, it says at least, but yeah. it's not like five, you know, there's, a, there's no patterns like uh, even on the Linux kernel that you have about seven or eight release candidates and then we release every so often. There's none of that. Um, it's a lot of folks saying how much they've vetted it, how much they test it, how much they feel com comfortable that any changes that we make after a 1.0 aren't going to be bolted on. We feel pretty comfortable with that. So with the runtime, we're at RC5. Um, I mean, I didn't prepare for this, but we could like put up the vote right here on the stage <laughs> for that, uh, for the 1.0, and, and it would likely uh, have like a weak vet turnaround yeah. because that, this is just waiting on like a rebase of some of the tools that are consuming Run C, yeah. so Run C being on the, this updated implementation, you know, green flags up the CI CD stack that are consumers of this implementation, let's go. Uh, for the image spec, there's a few changes in one of the recent RCs, uh, so we probably will have at least one more RC for that and then put a similar vote process. Uh, so um, I, I can fairly comfortably say that within a month or two, both will be at a 1.0, uh, and this, this is great because for so many people in the room, if you are looking to see what that means for you or if you're writing tools that interact with this, uh, there have been a, a brave few people say, I will take a pre-release spec and implement my tools for it. Uh, you know what you're getting into at that point. God knows enough people watched AMQP. Um, <laughs> but most people are saying, once it's 1.0, let's go. Uh, and we are, we are within a month or two of that. Yeah, and um, just a, what, one of the sort of lines that we've been trying to ride is, I think, um, there's been a couple of people who had a very fair criticism about uh, not having implementations of the, some of the release candidates. And so we've been writing this line of writing a specification and then trying to encourage people to actually build software against the specification and then getting feedback. Uh, so I just wanted to like recognize some of the like projects that are doing that hard work. So Run C has had to put up with a lot of changes. <laughs> um, so bless the heart of everyone on that team. Um, and then on the image spec side, uh, folks like Amazon's uh, Elastic Container Registry implemented a draft specification of the OCI image spec, um, which was very bold of them to like put that into beta um, on a public on a public service that they have to maintain as like software as a service. I um, love surprises. Yeah, um, and so. Uh, there's been a lot of other projects. There's been multiple implementations of the runtime spec. Um, stuff like Containerd and Rocket, et cetera, are implementing both image spec and runtime spec, um, either through dependent projects or independent implementations. There's Cypher did uh, uh, his own implementation of the runtime spec, et cetera, et cetera. So um, a lot of the credit for the progress also goes to the folks that are yeah. actually holding us accountable that this can be uh, built into code. Cool. Um, so before I kind of um, ask our pa lovely panelists about kind of the future of OCI, what you know, are we done when we hit 1.0 or not? Uh, I'd like to kind of um, turn it over to the audience and see if there's any questions um, that you have uh, about OCI uh, to the folks that work on it. Yes, let's be fun. Okay, my main question is uh, regarding networking. So the CNI and the CNM equivalent uh, words, let's say in quotes, what is the status there with the network? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take a swing at it as <laughs> one of the people responsible for CNI. Um, so where we're at there is that um, we, we have a bunch of implementations of CNI, um, both on the people consuming it, so projects like Kubernetes and Mesos and Cloud Foundry, I believe, and then um, network vendors implementing it. So you have Flannel and Weave and Calico and Contiv, and uh, I'm sure I'm missing somebody who's gonna be mad at me later. Um, and so I, I think that ecosystem is going along nicely, and I think it's a natural fit for CNCF uh, yeah. at some yeah. point. Um, 
simply because like we do have a lot of the cloud native scheduling systems uh, utilizing it and, today. So. And in, in particular, OCI, if the current scope networking and like storage is, is out of scope. So CNI would not be a natural fit for, for OCI. Yep. Yeah, so I, I can add to that. Uh, so, so networking definitely was not out of scope, uh, or was That's, out of scope of OCI. Yeah. Uh, and um, in Container D, uh, so the goal of Container D is to be that core container runtime that Kubernetes or Docker could use. Uh, and initially, we had uh, networking at like um, we had four steps into our roadmap into 1.0. Initially, we had networking in there with a nice sentence in the roadmap saying, uh, oh, we need to find something that's between CNI, which is pretty low level, and CNM, which is much higher level. Something in between that would work for both. Uh, very quickly, after some discussions, we just decided that it's out of scope for <laughs> ContainerD as well. So the way you're doing, uh, you're doing networking is that the higher level system like Kubernetes is going to do its CNI business for networking and then create the network namespaces and inject them in the container. And Docker will do the same for CNM. Uh, so it's out, out of the like core container runtime today. Uh, I'd say in the future, there needs to be some discussion about how to maybe reconcile these models, but there, it seems to be a, a pretty difficult task. Uh, I just, I'll throw something out controversial. So uh, one of the great things about uh, these these specifications and like solving this is um, largely like I'm not super sympathetic to network vendors. Uh, like if they have to write two whole plugins to plug into this entire ecosystem here, I, I'm okay with them wasting a little bit of time and effort. Um, and so like I, I think it's a great long term goal to reconcile the two models. But largely, it's not an unreasonable amount of effort to have, like, in a gigantic company like Cisco, write two plugins. So, it's a strong, it's a strong ask. Uh, any other uh, questions? I think I saw another hand, but I don't. Nope. All right, we'll have time uh, at the end. So, a um, couple final uh, questions to the panelists. We have about ten minutes. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit of, of, about scope, right? So you know, OCI has very limited scope. We're getting close to 1.0. Um, what's going to happen after we declare 1.0? Are you know, are we done? Are we going to do a 2.0, 1.1? Like, what's what's the current thoughts within the OCI TDC of essentially either expanding expanding scope or you know, what, what's next essentially as you know, these things eventually do get kind of quote unquote boring and less innovative. So things naturally may uh, be, be standardized. Are you asking this personally, Chris? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, by two, two pieces, I don't have um, any crystal ball to say what's next. There are a number of items, even on the GitHub project, that have been brought up or viable conversations. Some of them are wildly nuanced, um, I mean, down to if anybody has waded into looking in the tar archive of a layer that gets transmitted, whether or not the whiteout file should be in an order or not. Like, this is one of those things where you're like, uh, okay, fine, we'll, we'll say it this way, but if we change it, it is a breaking operation, that's a post 1.0 conversation, we'll punt it. Uh, so there very likely could be you know, versions that just make iterations on this. Uh, I would not imagine, nobody wants a complicated matrices of like partially, you know, like whether it's V1.1 or V1.0. Um, but like Sardi mentioned, signing has come up, distribution has come up, possible other ways besides tar, tar archives at all has come up. Um, these kind of iterations, uh, what would be the, you know, then effectively the question becomes what's the cadence of the difference between a 1.1 1 .1 or what's the difference between a 1.0.1? Um, you know, is there a big breaking, world changing 2.0 that we're going to go after that's just going to wreck the world? Um, no, there's no imminent plans for a lot of this. Um, and some of those, like, iterations on improving or mm -hmm. making other opportunities. 
uh, would largely come out of what we found as to be uh, best practice or like mm -hmm. we've improved on and gotten rid of whiteouts entirely and this is a non-conversation anymore. Um, so I don't, I don't foresee it, it, I don't foresee the future being either quitting, like we're done, um, and I also don't see it being like, here's this other thing that we're gonna come out with a 2.0 and just break it now completely for, at all. For, for the purposes of clarity, when you say distribution, what do you exactly mean? Um, so for by and large, and, and even to testament to Amazon, and we have a pull request up for the Docker distribution project, um, the Docker registry is viably the de facto standard for di for distribution. There's some extent of like you know saving and sa saving a serialized output that you distribute by your own means. Um, <clears throat> but the a common question is, what's the API that I need to push or pull these these objects? Because when you go look at particularly for like the image spec. Um, largely it is like, here's how you pack a tar archive and here's the JSON to describe it and here's the JSON to describe the checksum of those things. Um, it is wildly simple in certain ways. Uh, and the immediate, the immediate in, intuitive thought is, cool, how do I, you know, how do I send this? What do I, what API do I push these objects to? Uh, and how do I pull them back? You know, how do I build anything higher um, and logically, it is a Docker registry API. Um, it's just one of, one of the things is as we've iterated on these particular MIME types or media types, um, is we'll get to that next. Um, and, and I think to some extent, it's not any concern that the Docker registry API is going to change. Uh, it's just we, wanna, we wanted to do things in lockstep fashion of like we've solved the media MIME type for a foreseeable future. We can now have this other conversation, and that's what I mean when 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 I when I and other people refer to the distribution of it, mm -hmm. it's this kind of like potential APIs. Cool. So uh, when we're say anything. What, yeah, and I was like, anyone? No, no one else wants to talk about the future. Just like all out of Vincent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, obviously, you have opinions here. <laughs> well, I, I guess some context on the future stuff. So um, there are. So with 1.0, one of the things that we sort of early agreed upon was to, for people who wanted to build it into the registry, like Amazon, um, we wanted to make it as easy for them uh, without much disruption to convert images into OCI. And one of the early compromises was um, ensuring that, so, so there's two pieces of an image. There's the metadata that describes the image and then that uh, tarball that has uh, all the files in it. And we didn't really want to disrupt the tarballs uh, if we could avoid it, because that means that the bulk of the storage um, we, could, we could avoid touching. Um, you know, the gigabytes and gigabytes of data for, uh, or probably this petabytes of data that are container images in the world today, um, it'd be really nice if we didn't have to touch those tarballs and we could just uh, have JSON metadata outside of the tarball. Um, so that we could reach reach down and um, and have those images be become OCI images. Cool. Uh, question for for Jeff, since you've been involved kind of in the certification efforts. So uh, one aspect of generally a standard is you know once you kind of build out specifications, generally there's some way to uh, you know verify that implementations are compliant or conformant to some nature. So what's currently our thoughts uh, on this in, in OCI? Uh, Jeff. So <clears throat> there's been a working group of a number of uh, uh, individuals and companies in the industry that have been looking at this issue of uh, certification. And um, they've looked at different past examples from different entities, other foundation, uh, Linux Foundation initiatives around IoT, um, others around from like the Eclipse Foundation. Mm -hmm. And ultimately what we're trying to do is strike that balance between, you know, how can we make this rigorous enough so that you as end users of this can have high confidence that when you see something has been certified by the w working group that you're going to have high reliability about its conformance uh, to the spec. On the other end, you don't want to make it so onerous or, or you don't want to make it so lightweight that it, you know, ultimately becomes sort of a self-check yeah. the box and, you know, you hope everyone's in that. So we're getting... Now that we're getting into what Chris likes to call burndown on the V1 of the format and runtime, 
uh, the dust will settle on that and we'll really roll up our sleeves and start to look to pin down um, the procedures that we'll agree to and strike that balance and um, look for feedback from you to get it right. And I think Chris is worried about the future because it's job security. What's going to happen to the OCI? <laughs> but no, yeah, we're hey, going to be here, go. Chris. Hey. You're all right. Hey, CNCF's doing fine, so it's all good. No, <laughs> no but uh, if you think about it, though, I think it's a healthy balance yeah. in the ecosystem, right? I think it's yeah. fortuitous it's kind of turned out this yeah. way. I know it's been confusing to people on you know, outside <laughs> or don't you know, swim in the yeah. fishbowl, but I think of it as like the Asian yin and yang symbol, right, where you've got folks that have been working on trying to fundamentally nail the basic building blocks. Right. And then you've got this other entity, the CNCF, looking at this larger orchestration picture. And uh, now with Container D coming in and with Rocket coming in, it really kind of gives um, a glue to that balance. And uh, so it's, it's on us to get it right over the next six, 12, 18 months as this all plays out. Definitely. <clears throat> okay, we have a few minutes left. Uh, are there any questions uh, in the audience for the panelists? Yes. Let's see. I think we already had a discussion earlier on. So I wonder in the cloud native computing world and ecosystem, you have chosen the OCI being the standardized level and the standardized abstraction. You feel this is the right abstraction or you feel there is other interfaces, other things which are more important to standardize than uh, the OCI part. Yeah, I said, you want uh, yeah sure. Um, so I, I think by analogy, if we think about um, the successes and failures of virtual machines, um, for the last 10 years, virtual machines have been um, kind of the dominant consumption model for compute, and particularly uh, applications as well. Um, we have like virtual machine stores on Amazon and virtual machine stores on all the other cloud providers and for VMware, et cetera. Um, but the missed opportunity there was workload mobility. And um, largely that is the promise of cloud native, is that through containers, you're able to move workloads across um, different environments, different compute network storage stacks. And so I do believe that container images are the abstraction of this entire movement. Um, much like virtual machines have been the abstraction of IaaS for the last uh, 10 years, but what we're doing here, and I think it's through a lot of hard work and a lot of courageous uh, leaps of faith of all these organizations represented, that um, we're actually working together to ensure that um, we actually deliver on the promise of portability, um, which was just largely a missed opportunity of the last decade. Absolutely, and I'll just uh, add to that that uh, when I first started working in open source, it was around a yeah, IBM strategy for Linux across its hardware portfolio, which 10 years ago included the mainframe, power systems, and x86 systems from IBM. 10 years ago, um, those were swim lanes to a degree in that it was pretty clear 10 years ago that, well, lightweight applications you want, you could run over here. If you wanted something that had horsepower in the Unix class machines, you could put it here. And then if you wanted a really trusted environment, you could put it up on the mainframe. But over, you know, when I started to look at that and you looked at the value that clients saw from running Linux across those hardware architectures, my next logical question was, well, what's our cross-platform Linux strategy for virtualization? And we didn't have one because IBM you know, had been doing virtualization on the mainframe since the late 70s. They brought that technology to power in the you know, uh, 90s. And so IBM um, uh, has been, at least personally from my perspective, it's something that I'm just thrilled to be a part of because I was looking for how this was going to play out in VMs, and, and uh, you just nailed it, um, how this is going to play out in containers, we've got a much better shot of getting this right, so. Cool. So um, one more question, anyone? Otherwise, uh, we're done. So uh, thank you, uh, panelists, for your time. Uh, I mean, oh, it, it, Microsoft loves containers, it's all good. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, but yeah. all, no, all kidding aside, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to say thanks as well. Yeah, uh, thank because you, Rob yeah. Dolan is yeah. a, 
a friend of mine, I'm out of Seattle, uh, which people hear that and they think, you know, you work for IBM, what are you up there for? But uh, uh, I've been working with Rob Dolan yeah. in the OCI yeah. Yeah. since the early days. Rob yeah. couldn't make it out here to Berlin. Yeah. Uh, so it was great so, of you to sit in for Rob on the panel. Absolutely. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, for uh, listening. And thank you, panelists, for taking the time. Thank you.